Okay, in this lecture, we are going to start talking about some of the symbols um, and diacritics that you can use when you are transcribing disordered speech, which may include sounds that are not normally in the International Phonetic Alphabet that we've been talking about. Um, and as an added treat, I'm going to let you look at my face while I talk about these. Uh, since some of these um, disordered type of sounds uh, have unusual places of articulation that it's easier to see what I'm talking about um, than try and visualize it as I describe it. All right, so um, as much as I can, I'm going to talk with this window here in the right. Hopefully it won't cover up too much of the text, but you can follow along with the slides that you have on your own. Um, but just to introduce you, we're talking about here a new set of symbols. For the most part, there's some overlap with what you've already learned in the class. Um, but what we're talking about here is another set of symbols that are considered extensions to the IPA chart. Um, although you'll see here it's organized the same way as um, the consonants of the IPA chart are with all these different manners of articulation over here on this side and different places of articulation up at the top of each column. Um, but these are extra symbols that were um, agreed upon by phoneticians to add because the International Phonetic Alphabet was originally only designed to cover all the sounds in human languages. Um, but when you're looking at disordered speech, people can actually make sounds that no actual language uses in its normal everyday speech. Um, so really there were um, instances of things that people can transcribe because they didn't have symbols for them. Um, so that's why we have this um, set of extra symbols here that we're going to be talking about. All right, so as we saw on the chart, there are uh, manners of articulation list listed um, for each row, just like our normal consonant chart on the IPA um, chart that we've learned. But there are some new manners of articulation that we're going to talk about here um, that are not found in natural, non-disordered language. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about, or the first two, refer to um, changes in fricatives. So as we talked about before, fricatives are um, sounds that are produced with turbulent airflow. And for the most part, we have a few lateral fricatives, like and a more of a voiced sort of lateral sound. Um, for the second one, voiceless for the first. Uh, but apart from those two sounds, not sounds we have in English, but other languages have them, the airflow in fricatives goes over the center of the tongue. If you imagine like kind of that line down the middle of my tongue, airflow follows that for the most part. Normally we think of fricatives as being mostly median apart from those two exceptions. Um, but in disordered speech, there can be sounds that are produced with a channel, two different channels, where it goes over the center of the tongue and to one or both sides, lateral. Right? And when you get that type of sound, there are two ways to transcribe it. All right, if I can get my drawing on. All right, you will have two different types of, oops, no, well, I guess my special pad isn't working here. Let's try this with my mouse. There is sort of a combination of an L and an S for that voiceless fricative with a lateral and a median channel, and an L and a combination of a Z for a voiced version of that sound. Right, and there are another way of thinking about fricatives as well. Normally, all of these fricatives we've talked about in natural, normal languages are produced 
purely orally, so there's nothing, no airflow through the nose. Um, but if you have some sort of problem, um, such as a problem caused with issues of cleft palate, you may have abnormal air escaping through the nose. Right? And a fricative that is, here we, I'm circling the word narial, that refers to the nares, those are your nostrils, so sort of the little uh, pieces of flesh that sort of go out on each side of your nostrils. That would refer to a fricative that has turbulent airflow at the nostrils. Um, and that sometimes happens, again, if there's unwanted air or air that shouldn't be going through the nose when you're producing a fricative. Normally all that air pressure should be in your mouth. Um, so you can add a special little diacritic above a symbol. Um, that's a really badly drawn tilde. Let me try my again. It's sort of like a tilde with two little dots on either side, and you can write that above the symbol um, above which, let's say if somebody is producing the narrow fricative with um, that turbulent airflow at the nostrils, but they're also producing mm, a normal M and as well, something that sounds like an M, but with that extra fricative, you could write it um, as this and just add that diacritic above. All right, our final different type of manner of articulation is called a percussive. And just like any type of percussion instrument, this name comes from musical instruments. Percussion instruments are instruments that make noise by striking something like a drum, or you can hit your hand on a bongo or hit a drum with a stick. Those are all percussion instruments. Percussive sounds in disordered speech would be something where you have two articulators hitting each other, usually something rigid. So your teeth or your lips, if they're held um, tightly. Kind of like that. Um, so the symbol for the teeth hitting together would be this one I'm drawing right now, where you have those two, they sort of look like our staple that's unstapled, um, as you might see it in a um, stapler on top of each other, or if you're hitting your lips together, that would be two W's, um, sort of going back to the idea of a W being a labial velar sound, something that has to do with your lips, so evoking that lip idea there in that symbol. Okay. So those are our different manners of articulation that are sort of new. Um, now we have a few different new places of articulation that we're going to talk about. There are um, things that are not included on the normal IPA chart because you either never see these in any sounds of any language in the world or they're so rare that um, they haven't been included as part of the normal IPA chart. And we'll go over each of these in turn and look at some of the symbols you might use. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is this one I'm circling here with the mouse, the dental labial. All right, or you have to think about what order to put those things. You've got dento, so you can think teeth and labial, meaning your lip. Um, that's going to give you your clues about what the place of articulation is. And this one, um, unlike our F or V sounds, where we have our bottom lip meeting our upper teeth, that's sort of the normal, that's our labiodental. This the place is reversed um, to indicate something abnormal. So this would be our top lip meeting our bottom teeth. So like this, not something normally seen for any language in the world. Um, and as you can see here, I've got symbols for p, b, m, f, and v with that sort of dental type diacritic, that little staple looking thing on top of it. 
to indicate that there's something different about how these sounds are being produced. Um, these are all either normally bilabial sounds or labiodental. Um, but if you try it out yourself, um, just making sure that you're doing that top lip, meeting your bottom teeth like this, you can probably try and produce all these sounds yourself. So you could produce something that sounds like almost like the normal one, but has this odd place of articulation. So, p, b, m, f, v. All right, fun stuff. Our next one, the second bullet point, is a labioalveolar, and that means you've got that lower lip meeting your alveolar ridge, and hopefully you've got a good bite meaning when you bite together, your upper teeth and your lower teeth meet at about the same place. It's not that one set or the other goes too much off of each other. So that's my bite. My dentists and orthodontists have worked hard on it. Um, but if you have a severe um, underbite, you might have a tendency for that lower lip to be pulled into the mouth because this jaw is going to be way further back in. Um, but you can do this by curling your lip in um, and producing, here we've got those same sounds I did before, but just try and produce them with your lower lip if you want to try it yourself, meeting your alveolar ridge. So, puh, the, 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 the. That would be your labioalveolar. And you can write those, whatever symbol applies to what sounds most like what the speaker is doing, and writing something that looks like an equal sign underneath. That will indicate um, sort of a alveolar place of articulation that is not expected for those sounds. None of those sounds is normally alveolar. All right, next we have our, I'm circling here, lingo labrial. Lingo labial. And that's the one uh, before we just showed or looked at some of those videos of Britney Spears lip syncing, where she gets a little bit over enthusiastic about making usually it's L uh, and sticking her tongue out and really exaggerating that. You can think of this as sort of a Britney Spears type sound. So lingo labial means you've got the tongue tip at apex meeting the upper lip. And here with our symbols, the diacritic you use is sort of like a little bit of a, if you were drawing a, a little bit of an abstract bird, it sort of looks like that's like two little bumps underneath each one. But you can try and produce these sounds. It'll be something, I'm going to say each of these sounds in turn. It's going to sound a lot like the normal sound, but just something's off. And you can clearly see that I'm using the lingual labial place of articulation uh, watching here. So, pa, ba, na, la. All right, that would be examples of each of those sounds with that atypical place. Finally, um, you can talk about interdental as an atypical place of articulation. Um, in English, our dental fricatives, those TH sounds are usually often produced with interdental place of articulation, and that's not considered disorder. So th and th, um, that would not be atypical, but where it's not expected, you might want to use these diacritics. Again, you can recognize this dental diacritic and to indicate rather than just one um, part of the sound is involving the teeth, we have the dental diacritic on top and bottom um, to sort of give you a clue that's interdental, meaning between the teeth. So that would be um, something where the tongue tip is protruding, maybe in a child with tongue thrust, where instead of saying la, they're saying la, instead of ra, ra. All right, a little bit abnormal, although you may still hear some semblance of the normal sound in the examples I gave with the abnormal place of articulation. 
All right, the next place we'll talk about is bidental. Um, we've talked about interdental, but it is also possible to talk with clenched teeth like this. Uh, you might have done this if you're really angry with someone. Um, so things that um, it's not quite like percussives because it's not like you're hitting those teeth together, um, but could be used something where normally the teeth are not together and you're forcing air through clenched teeth. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this example, we have two types of H sounds, the voiceless and the voice ones. <sighs> where you're forcing that air through clenched teeth. Um, but you could also use those dental diacritics to indicate something like talking through clenched teeth. And the next one we're going to talk about is velopharyngeal, and that happens to be our last one. Before we talked about narrow friction, a velopharyngeal sound is um, something that is caused by turbulent airflow through the velopharyngeal cord. Um, so remember the velum, or we've got this little hinge at the back of our, let's see this way, um, back of our mouth, that velum, and it has to meet up against the pharyngeal wall. So that velum is normally relaxed and downward, so we can breathe through our nose, but when we need to make an oral sound, that velum is going to close up against the velopharyngeal wall so that no air can get into our nasal cavity. Um, so that's our velopharyngeal port. But if it's not closed tightly and there's a little bit of a gap there, that can cause some turbulent airflow. Um, and that's where you get this constriction. And that turbulent airflow can be heard as a velopharyngeal sound. Um, so on its own, it can be written as this symbol, sort of like an F and an N together. Or if that is a sort of um, an added quality to a, a sound that sounds something similar to a typical sound, like a s you have that sort of velopharyngeal quality to it, you can add a diacritic, which would be those two tilde marks above the symbol that you think matches the sound you're hearing. Okay. Um, so that sort of covers our basics here um, that we've been talking about this part of the chart. Next, we're going to talk about some additions. Here, if you go down the x dipa chart, you'll see there are diacritics and some additional things um, to what we've been talking about. There are also ways to mark things that are going on or things that are just beyond the segment or just one sound level, so something that's going on over several sounds or connected speech. Um, and some other voicing things we'll talk about, as well as some just other miscellaneous stuff that doesn't really fit in any other category. All right, so we have um, a lot of these we've talked about, but we haven't talked about labial spreading. Here we've got a which wouldn't normally be produced with like a smile, like a spread lips. Usually has pretty neutral lips rather than shh, which often has rounded lips. But this with this diacritic would just mean for this particular sound, there is extra spread lips. So rather than shh. All right, and these other diacritics we have talked about previously. Um, now, thinking about other things that you might want to use um, in terms of diacritics, you think about dysarthria, that is a motor speech disorder um, caused by a neurological damage, which means there's sort of abnormal muscle activity. Uh, sometimes can be caused things to be, um, sounds to be produced a little bit different. So people have trouble with their muscles and making sounds because of that. So if you have an extra strong sound, um, you can add this type of diacritic here. I'm circling with my mouse over the F, where it's extra forceful. So rather than maybe it's or if it's extra weak, here we've got the second example here with where maybe the person isn't really getting things right in place, and that sound sounds extra 
sort of weak, for lack of a better term to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost not a fricative. You can indicate that with these diacritics. Um, another type of speech disorder that you might commonly want to transcribe would be stuttering, where sometimes speech sounds are repeated over and over. So here we have a reiterated articulation or repeated sound. Um, this would be pup, pup, pup. So three P sounds after another. So you can just, whatever sound is repeated, indicate that by writing the symbol repeatedly and putting slashes between it. Um, also, I'm a terrible whistler, so I'm not very good, but if, um, oftentimes in older speakers, um, or sometimes accidentally, we will whistle a little bit. That's my really bad attempt at a whistle while producing a sound. And if it sounds a little whistly, you can use a little upward arrow. So this would be more like a whistle on an S, which is not something I'm really good at. Um, this last one, I guess I'll move my window here so you can see this. This would be a a voiceless th here next to an s and this little arrow indicates that as a person was putting trying to produce the sound they sort of slid between two our sounds so their placement of their articulators sort of moves from a position to a s so a s indicates there's some sort of sliding movement between our sounds so you can choose whatever sounds you think the person was sliding between and just write that sort of connecting arrow underneath to indicate that sliding type of articulation. Okay, um, moving on, uh, we've talked about um, nasal narrow fricatives. This is where we have this nasal escape, so some sort of um, frication noise that's not normally there. It's, air is escaping through the nose, and it seems to be more at the um, outside. We talked about that before, but sounds also can be denasal. That sort of sounds like when you have a cold. So your nose is either plugged up, here I'm doing it manually, um, but if sounds are denasal, you can indicate that by writing a tilde and sort of crossing it out. Um, here is that velopharyngeal um, type we talked about before where there's extra friction. This would be on an S sound. Um, and if you think way back, we talked about different air streams. You can also indicate whether airflow is switching between egressive, that would be our normal, or we speak on an exhale. And if it's switching to ingressive, you can just use a different direction arrow to indicate <gasps> that air is sort of that vocalization is being made on an intake while you're sucking in air. All right, now you may not want to um, indicate unexpected things or things that you're hearing just on single speech sounds, but on longer stretches of speech. And these are some of the type of things you can do. You can indicate whether there is a pause in speech, just like that, whether it's short, medium, or long, by putting a different number of dots in parentheses. And these following indications are taken from uh, musical terms that are already used for, you know, whether the musician should get louder, quieter, play faster, or slower. And these just refer to Italian terms that are commonly used in music. So F is for forte, two Fs is for fortissimo, P is for piano, um, two Ps is for pianissimo, um, and allegro means fast and lento is slow. So you can use those um, like this. You can add them around to each side. Here would be your word quieter, which would be quieter, and you have the PP, the pianissimo, on either side to indicate that this whole word was produced quieter than other words in the utterance. 
And finally, you can use other terms for music. This crescendo would mean getting increasingly louder and louder as it goes on. Um, this one means slowing down. Rallentando means slowing down. Other terms for music can be used as needed, but that covers most of the basics. All right, so this is an example of how you might use these um, sort of extra descriptors on in within your transcription. Okay, almost to the end here. There are a few more diacritics here that can be used to indicate, and here I think I'll make my window smaller. You don't need to look at my mouse so much anymore. Um, indicate changes with voicing. Um, so whether there is um, unexpected a voicing that goes beyond the uh, sound boundary or some devoicing either before, after the sound, or in the middle of the sound. Um, all of these different symbols will help you describe that. Um, finally, aspiration is considered part of voicing since, um, like in languages like English, it's an important cue to um, voicing since only our voiceless stops are aspirated, so sometimes just having the voicing there tells us the difference between p, a voiceless sound, and b, a voice sound. Um, but if there's some unexpected difference there, you can indicate unaspiration, um, as in here with those diacritics, or uh, some difference in where the aspiration occurs, as in p, like let's say it's sounding like it's coming before the sound by just moving that little symbol. Um, normally we'd write it after the P, but here it's before to indicate that the aspiration comes before the P sound is produced, not after. Finally, we have a few extras that may come in handy, especially um, when it comes to um, so-called indeterminate sounds. Sometimes you're not gonna have an idea uh, what exactly the sound is that you are transcribing. Either there's not going to be a clue here at the level where you could easily see if you're lucky enough to be transcribing while you're watching your speaker's mouth move, um, and it's further in and you can't tell exactly what's going on with the articulation, or you're working with an audio recording and it just doesn't resemble any sound you know. Um, so different ways can be um, used to indicate that depending on how much of a guess, an educated guess you have over the sound. Um, the basic would be the use of parentheses. Here I'm circling with my mouse and the line above and below. And you can add the level of detail, you know, such as you think it's some sort of consonant or vowel, or you are sort of speculating by um, saying that it sounds like it's a plosive, some sort of stop and voiceless. You can add as much detail as you can figure out um, in between those parentheses and lines. Um, if something is completely silent, as in mouth, here like you can put it in parentheses. Or if there's anything extra that's going on, like hear somebody knocking, you put that in double parentheses just to indicate that some other noise in your speech sample that doesn't really reflect anything the speaker is doing. And finally there are you know a set of you can look on the X type of chi chart there's other symbols to indicate other sounds or if you just really have no idea it's, it sounds like some sort of sound and you want to use your own sort of description but you have no particular IPA symbol to base it on, you can always preface uh, or sort of precede that whatever you decide to write down with an asterisk to indicate that it doesn't reflect anything in the IPA or these X type of symbols. All right, so those are just some more of our indeterminate sounds that might actually be some that if you're dealing with a particularly challenging speech sample where you're not exactly sure what you're coming out or dealing with, it might be some of the more handy 
ways of transcribing at least what you might be hearing. All right, so that is the end of um, our coverage of some of these extra symbols for transcribing some of those really unusual disordered sounds. Um, let me know what questions you have when you're completing your warm up, what else we can talk about in class um, to help you practice these concepts.